Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, so, tonight my talk will be about using Docker on AWS. Uh, just a bit about me and my company. Uh, I'm the Han Yen, or you can call me Chris. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Pi, so uh, domain Pi uh, So we make chat application for work. And there I'm, I work as primary, primarily as a backend DevOps guy. And yeah, my contact details are there. So about Pi. So Pi is a startup. Uh, we are a very small unit, about eight people right now. So we make a, a chat application for work. So it's like a WhatsApp. And what it does is uh, yes, multi device sync across all your devices. And also, I have a watch application as well. And the best thing is, we build Pi using Pi itself. Right. So, how do we make an application like Pi? We need, um, well, basically, all these uh, regular things you need for uh, reliable, uh, high availability chat application. Also, failover and also rapid product iteration with zero downtime deployment. So, AWS provides all these things, uh, rapid infrastructure provisioning, uh, load balancing across different availability zones, and auto scaling with reliable and performant data stores, so uh, backups and failover as well. And this is the architecture that we came up with. So we make heavy use of uh, AWS features. Our backend database is uh, Postgres, hosts on RDS. And we make use of load balancers, both internal and external as well. And everything is hosted within a virtual uh, VPC. And our front end is actually served using CloudFront and is backed using uh, Amazon S3. So it's a step defined end, a single page application, and which calls an API that relies on uh, RDS. And we also have a service cluster, which contains uh, all our backend workers, which run uh, tasks uh, that are passed to it by a queue system. So we have background workers, a uh, queue system, and basically uh, all load balance across different zones. <laughs> and the choice of technology we use is Docker. So uh, yes, just, just the same version. Docker uh, is a glorified usage root gel. But I think this does not really do it justice because there's more to it. It also does image management and data volume management as well. So what it does is you can package your application into a Docker image and then push it to a central registry. And this differs from virtual machines in that uh, Docker images are very lightweight. And when you run them, that you are essentially just running a process which is isolated uh, using ch root, using c groups, and so on. So uh, much faster start times, much easier management. So before, in order to manage your host, you need to have specialized server provisioning, which are susceptible to configuration drift, and you may have conflicting dependencies, especially if you have. Uh, diverse workloads across different hosts, for example. So when you use Docker, you can actually simplify your infrastructure into homogeneous hosts, and you have minimal for provisioning using cloud config. So you only need the Docker agent or the Docker daemon to run on your host. And this gives rise to immutable infrastructure. So if you need to update, uh, or maybe your host OS, for example, then you just blow away your machines and then just start new ones. And Docker containers provide you uh, dependency isolation. So that means developers can now maintain uh, application environment themselves and then just deploy to production using Docker containers. So usually in development or staging, you have uh, one single host and multiple Docker containers, but in production, as uh, seen from the earlier architecture diagram. You have multiple hosts which uh, have different roles, for example. 
for, for example, the service containers at the back, and then the APIs, uh, API hosts in the front. So, how do you coordinate your Docker containers across this uh, entire infrastructure? So, there are several solutions. The one that we use is CoreOS. So, CoreOS is a specialized distribution of Linux, uh, which primarily provides tools used for container orchestration. So, CoreOS is com comprises these particular tools, uh, etcd, fleet, and systemd. So fleet, uh, sorry, etcd is used as a synchronization layer, and fleet is used as uh, the orchestration. So it uh, provides commands to systemd to run Docker containers, to manage the container lifecycle, and so on. So our approach is to have central services and worker clusters. So we don't have nearly as much hosts as depicted here, but the idea is we have a central fleet cluster, and based on that fleet cluster, we have a series of uh, workers, so which run the main workload. And the fleet cluster is to provide a synchronization on also central services such as our queue system and so on. And both clusters can be both clusters can be scaled separately. So in order to schedule units, uh, units are written as systemd units. So these units have uh, fit specific metadata, and this metadata can be used to des designate certain uh, hosts uh, with different roles. For example, you have the API host or you have the service host, for example, and they will run different kinds of service units. So this is an example of the output they get when you uh, list all the workloads in your uh, CoreOS cluster. And we also run a CI/CD pipeline. Uh, the use of Docker has heavily, heavily changed the way we do CI/CD. We now, whenever we push to the Git registry, <coughs> sorry, whenever we push to GitHub. Uh, this triggers uh, this triggers a test and build cycle in our CI server. So we use Circle CI as an integration point. Then when Circle CI finishes building the image, then it pushes it to the registry. And this is an example of the output. So we actually test using a Docker container. So this is to simulate the production environment as much as possible. So whenever we run tests, we actually build the Docker container, run the test inside, and then only then we push it to the registry. So this is the entire process. So when we want to kick off a new build, first we actually modify uh, our own Py checks application. So this coordination is done using Kubot. We actually make use of the bot which receives commands through chat, and then it notifies uh, Docker to pull the registry, pull the deploy container. So everything is containerized. We have a deploy system which uses uh, Ansible to run a series of commands. And this entire Ansible container is then pulled from the registry, and then we then run the entire series of commands to so notify fleet that we need to deploy a new build. And this is synchronized across the entire cluster. So the cluster will now pull the new container from the registry and then switch out the API with the new versions. Um, so uh, I'll just show you a bit how we do it because it's uh, all just uh, just talking. So probably it's better if I show you exactly what happens. So this is our chat application, uh, and this is a chat room where we actually interact with a uh, robot. So what happens when we issue the command?
Okay, and then we can actually see what happens behind the scenes. So it's actually pulling the deployed container that is running the migration scripts, then you can see the Ansible output. Okay, so it already happened. So basically now the containers have been updated, then we switch with the new versions, and it runs the post-deploy migration, and that's it. Then it sends a message to the channel say, okay, deployment is done. Yep. Uh, how come you uh, you did your oh, right, Huber into your chat application? Where was the interface there to kick off the job? Okay, uh, our Huber is actually run inside a Docker container, so it has a connection to the chat server. Uh, okay, oh, yeah. so it's like, it's, like, it's like a chat member of the chat group? Yes. So this is how we coordinate a lot of our different operations as well, so we just write through what. Okay. Just now you saw the, all the logs coming through on paper trail. So that's how we do our logging uh, setup. For logging and metrics, you can have uh, agent containers that hook into the Docker API to collect all the stats and all the outputs. So there are a few projects that facilitate this. For example, C Advisor and Hipster by Google. Or you can also use Datadog and Scout monitoring containers. Also, the new version of newer versions of Docker uh, 1.6 mm -hmm. onwards, they add logging drivers that let you redirect the container output to, for example, CSOM. Yeah, so this is what happens. We also have a matrix set up. So we actually uh, send metrics from our different containers into a new class DB database, and then we just apply a graph on our way to look at, to create graphs. So this is, a, this is what our graph on setup looks like. So we can see just now, there was a deployment. Yeah. And it's shown on the graph. <coughs> yeah, so that was the demo just now. Uh, there are some things that Docker doesn't provide. So these are some of the questions I receive uh, quite frequently, like how do you uh, migrate data containers? For example, if you have a cluster and then your uh, app, uh, app container migrates to a different server, so how do you ensure that your data goes with you as well? So these, these are some of the things that Docker doesn't provide by default. So you have to make use of external, uh, service, external software, for example, Flockr. And also there are certain uh, features that people want like overlay networking, like how do you uh, address each container with a certain IP. So that's projects I plan on that, let you do that. And so there's, there's a question also, why if we were to switch to, let's say, Amazon ECS. So Amazon has a service called uh, EC2 Container Service. So what are the parallels to it? So, we use core OS, it uses split for synchronization, oh, sorry, not fit, but ETCD. So now the synchronization is provided by AWS API. So you send commands to the API and then it, uh, it coordinates the cluster for you. And systemd is of fit, is taken over by the ECS agent container. And instead of writing unit files, you will write ECS task definitions. So this is how everything works together. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Uh, anybody have any questions? So if your images in Docker Hub or you have a private registry, you your... Okay. Uh, we actually use a private registry, but the issue was that the private registry had created quite a lot of issues. Sometimes they had errors like uh, mysterious status codes when trying to move on it. So we switched to the Docker Hub. 
And which was my IE solution as well because the Docker Hub is also rather unreliable. So we are actually looking into ways to solve this. Uh, somebody actually came up with a solution that is to bypass the registry, registry completely and just dump the images onto uh, S3. And with all the JSON files that let you like uh, read all the different kinds of endpoints, simulate the endpoints on S3 as well. So that's one way. But yeah, for now we are using the Docker Hub. Uh, yes, well, changing from is we, I studied for a little bit. Uh, it's kind of, uh, I stalled for a while because I'm still trying to solve the issue of what happens when we are trying to do a migration of the API and we need zero <coughs> downtime. Because what we do is a little bit uh, unconventional in that we actually have HGX containers in front of our APIs. And we also have ConfD, which actually reads, uh, which monitors the ETCD data store. So whenever we do a switch, we spin up the additional container and then we do the switch of the ports in Nginx. Only then we spin up the other container. So I'm still looking at how to do that uh, with ECS. So you do have to actually solve ECS eventually? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you very much.